scripture verse is Galatians chapter 3 verse 12. The Bible says, And the law is not of faith. Galatians 3 verse 12. Our confessional juxtaposition is the Westminster Larger Catechism Q&A 30. The catechism asks, Doth God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? The answer, God doth not leave all men to perish in the estate of sin and misery into which they fell by the breach of the first covenant, commonly called the covenant of works, but of his mere love and mercy delivered his elect out of it and bringeth them into an estate of salvation by the second covenant, commonly called the covenant of grace. The Westminster Larger Catechism, Q&A 30. Now our sermon, our introduction. The last sermon introduced the law-gospel distinction. Strictly speaking, law is the term used when referring to the covenant of works, which can be found summarily comprehended by the Ten Commandments, while the gospel is the term used for referring to the covenant of grace, which you can find summarily comprehended in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4, through 4, which we'll be taking a look at here in a second. In this strict sense, both law and gospel can be found throughout the entire Bible. So it is important to be able to rightly distinguish and separate the law from the gospel and its promises. When the law is kept separate from the gospel, then we can clearly see the bad news emerge. The bad news is that Adam fell into sin. He sinned against God's covenant of works, broke the commandment, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result of the fall, all of Adam's natural posterity are born sinful, unable to do any good, and under the just condemnation of the law. Left to themselves, all of Adam's natural posterity will spend eternity in the lake of fire. The law teaches us the bad news. When the law is kept separate from the gospel, then the good news also comes into clear sight. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The good news is that Jesus Christ took the sins of his people, suffered in their place, performed the righteousness they should have done, satisfied the law for them, and gives them eternal life. The Bible says, and I quote, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. Those whom Jesus died for are saved merely by the imputed righteousness of Christ received by faith alone. Those saved by Jesus are not required to do anything for their salvation. Not one work. For the Bible says, quote, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. End quote. Romans chapter 3 verse 28 gospel teaches us the good news. The gospel is good news. In this sermon, beloved, we will attempt to see what the law and the gospel have in common. You know they have a lot in common. And it is important to know how the law and the gospel identify. Then we will try to understand the differences between the law and the gospel, how they oppose one another. All of this will help us to identify the law and the gospel then to keep them separate from one another. Now the importance of this cannot be stressed enough, so please pay attention. Part 1. And the law is not of faith. In this verse, the word faith refers to the gospel. For the object of saving faith is always the gospel, and never anything we do. So Paul is telling us of the opposition between the law and the gospel. They oppose each other concerning the method of justifying a man. Even so, just because their methods of justification are different, this does not imply that the law and the gospel each have a different source. The truth is, they each have the same source of origin, which is the Bible. First, the law and the gospel are God's revelation to us. In this, they are alike. They are part of the Holy Scripture. They are both perfect, inerrant, and infallible. They are both part of the inspired, effectual, and living Word of God. The 
Bible says, quote, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe, end quote. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second, the law and the gospel are both absolutely essential. God predestined both to be necessary, to be a necessary part of the plan of salvation. Every Christian flees from the condemnation of the law and clings to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel produces faith in God's elect, causing them to keep God's commandments out of gratitude for such a great deliverance. Those who do not study the law cannot know their sin cannot know their misery, and cannot understand the gospel, while those who do not study the gospel cannot know how God is both just and the justifier of the ungodly. Even after conversion, the law teaches Christians how to behave, how to love God and man. Thus, the law and the gospel are both essential to Christianity. you got to have them both. Finally, the law and the gospel each share an identical purpose. The purpose of the law and the gospel is to justify men by a perfect righteousness. Anyone who can come to the law with a perfect righteousness will be, the, will be justified before God. The Bible is clear on this. Jesus says, and I quote, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. End quote. Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. Well, the gospel also justifies with a perfect righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. In fact, Jesus Christ is called the Lord our righteousness in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. Pay attention to this verse, for it says that the Messiah shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Paul asserts it is only the righteousness of Christ, which David speaks about, when he writes the following, quote, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. End quote. Romans 4, verse 6. Both law and gospel each have their own way, their own method of justifying men before God. Yet the law is now no safe way for sinners to seek justification before God. Part 2. And the law is not of faith. Having discussed what the law and gospel have in common, we now come to the differences between the law and the gospel. How does the law and the gospel oppose one another? In what ways are they incompatible? And in what manner can they, set, can they be said to be contradictories? This is the great task before us. So let's begin with what kind of persons the law and the gospel seek to justify. Well, the first difference I will point out to you is who the law and the gospel seek to justify. The law seeks to justify the righteous man, the one who has never done anything wrong, the one who has done perfect obedience to the commands of God. Concerning those who labor under the law, the Bible says, quote, the man that doeth them shall live in them. End quote. Galatians chapter 3 verse 12. The law justifies the righteous and only the righteous. If you have never sinned, if you are perfectly righteous, then the covenant of works is for you. The law is for you. On the other hand, the gospel seeks to justify the unrighteous sinner the one who has disobeyed the commands of God and still disobeys them. The gospel justifies the wicked and only the wicked. Our dear brothers and sisters, do you not know the words of Jesus? Our Savior says, quote, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, end quote. Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. The gospel is for sinners. Gospel is for the wicked. The difference is found throughout the Bible. The law says, quote, Ye shall therefore 
keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord, in quote, Leviticus 18, verse 5. That's law. In contradistinction, the gospel says, quote, they that are of whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, in quote, Luke chapter 5, verse 31 through 32. That's who the gospel is for, the wicked. Again, the law says, I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them, Ezekiel 20, verse 11. That's the law. While the gospel message of Jesus is addressed to broken-hearted sinners, to those who are captive to sin, to wicked men who are spiritually blind and so on, Jesus proclaims, quote, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. End quote. Luke chapter 4 verses 18 through 19. The second difference between the law and the gospel is a grammatical one, a difference in grammar. The law presents to us imperative statements. Imperative statements are commands. They tell a person what they ought to do. They tell a person what they should do. For example, consider this well-known imperative statement from the Bible, Thou shalt not kill. You find it in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. This is an example of the law. The gospel, on the other hand, is always indicative, never imperative. An indicative statement grants us information about the subject of the sentence. The gospel is indicative, for it tells us who Jesus is and what he did for us. Consider this example from the Old Testament. Quote, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, end quote. Isaiah 53, verse 5. This indicative statement tells us how our sins were imputed to Jesus, how Jesus was punished for our sins. This is called expiation, by the way, and how Jesus justified us by being our legal substitute. This is, a good, this is good news. It is an example of the gospel. It's indicative. Jesus himself presents many imperatives in the New Testament. Some of them certainly point us to the gospel, but none of them are the gospel. For example, Jesus commands, quote, Repent ye and believe the gospel, end quote. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. This command directs us to what Jesus did for us. It points us to the gospel. It is not the gospel. Now those who do not believe the gospel are guilty of the sin of unbelief. Martin Luther believed the sin of unbelief violated the first of the Ten Commandments. Any sin, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism correctly explains, is the want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Thus, those who do not obey Jesus' command to believe the gospel are condemned by the law for unbelief. The command to believe the gospel is not the gospel. Another example of the Lord Jesus using the imperative mood is found in the Sermon on the Mount. There Jesus commands us saying, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This is an example of Jesus teaching law. Of course, none of us are perfect, nor can any of us keep God's law perfectly even after we're converted. No one reaches perfection until they're glorified. On the other hand, God's promise, his gospel promises, are indicative, not imperative. Consider this promise, quote, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also, there ye may be also, end quote. John chapter 14 verses 2 through 3. Here we are promised that Christ has gone to prepare a place for us and that Christ will surely come again for us. When we believe the gospel promises, 
then we have comfort and assurance. Beloved, when God promises to do something for us, then Jehovah tells us what will necessarily come to pass. He is not commanding us to do anything. This is an important difference between the law and the gospel. God's promises are always indicative, never imperative. A good exercise is to select a book from the Bible, then read through that book slowly, carefully picking out all the indicative and imperative verses. Interpreting the Bible grammatically is a very important part of Calvinism. Good grammar is not optional in Christianity. The grammatical difference overlaps our next difference between the law and the gospel. But don't worry, beloved, for this only reinforces its importance. The law always demands something from us. The law demands our righteousness. It demands our obedience to God's commandments. Now consider for a moment what type of legal substitute the law requires. What type of substitute does the law demand? If men are sinners, like they are now, then the law demands that a substitute for sinners not only be uh, a perfect man, but it also demands that the substitute be perfect God. This means that no mere man or angel could be our legal substitute in the covenant of grace. For no finite creature could endure the infinite omnipotent wrath of God. The legal substitute for our sins must be man, for it was man that sinned, but the surety must also be perfect God, for only one who is perfect God could sustain the punishment of Almighty God. Beloved, this is exactly why the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one qualified to be our surety and mediator, for Jesus is both God and man. The Bible says, quote, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. End quote. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. The law tells us it will not accept a mere man as a legal substitute when it states, quote, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give a ransom for him. End quote. Psalm 49, verse 7. If there is no proper substitute for an individual, then the law clearly states, quote, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither, the, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. End quote. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The reprobates do not have a legal substitute for their sins. But this is not the case with the elect. The elect are the members of of the covenant of grace. So when they are justified by the imputed righteousness of Christ, then they are rescued from the condemnation of the law. The gospel does not demand any obedience from the elect. It demands no righteousness from us who believe it. Let me say this again. The gospel never demands us to obey God's commands. Instead, the gospel provides the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ for us. The gospel does not demand, it provides. This is good news. So it is worth saying again, the gospel provides what the law demands. Perfect righteousness. Where does the righteousness come from that is provided by the gospel? It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, who kept the law for us, and who is called our righteousness. The Bible says that the Messiah will be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. The Apostle Paul tells us plainly about the righteousness that the gospel provides when he writes the following, quote, But what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God 
by faith, end quote. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Paul has been provided a perfect righteousness by the gospel, a righteousness received by faith alone. The righteousness through the faith of Christ, this righteousness through faith in Christ is the imputed righteousness of Jesus provided by the gospel. The law demands, but the gospel provides. Friends, here is the final difference I will mention in this sermon, and it is important. The law terrifies, but the gospel comforts. That the law is horrifying to a sinner is evident in many places of Scripture. For example, it is called the ministration of death in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. The law is called the ministration of condemnation in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. How scary is that? It's pretty scary. Beloved, would you approach something titled the ministration of death, the ministration of condemnation for comfort and assurance? Sinners will only find death and condemnation from the law as soon as they apprehend what the law actually means. They become terrified. Paul gives us an example of how terrifying the law is even after a person has, be, has been converted to Christianity. In the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul writes, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. It might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Romans chapter 7 verses 9 to 13. When Paul came to understand the law, then his sin was manifested unto him. Paul admits, I had not known sin but by the law. Romans chapter 7 verse 7. He truly saw how sinful he was, and he didn't hesitate to proclaim himself to be the chief of all sinners even after his conversion. Paul is teaching us to never seek comfort and assurance in the law, but to trust in the gospel for comfort and assurance. For after Paul miserably cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans chapter 7 verse 24. Then he immediately clings to the gospel, exclaiming, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans chapter 7, verse 25. Paul understood and taught that the law terrifies, but the gospel comforts. Likewise, believing the gospel promises also gives us comfort and assures us of our salvation. Once the law has done its work of terrifying us, beloved, the Bible says, quote, he that believeth upon him is not condemned. End quote. John chapter 3 verse 18. This is a gospel promise. And it teaches us that if we believe the gospel, then we are not condemned. If we are not condemned, then we are forgiven, justified, and saved. Believing this gospel promise gives us certainty and assurance. Certainty of our salvation, assurance of eternal life, comes not from the law but from believing the gospel and the promises of the gospel annexed to it. The Bible says, quote, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. If we believe this proposition, then we believe that God is at peace with us. We believe that God is not angry with us, and we believe that this comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, quote, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. End quote. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. The Bible here promises that we who believe the gospel shall be saved. God cannot break his promises, for God cannot lie. This means that if you believe the gospel, then it is a certainty that you will be saved. 
This means you cannot lose your salvation. For God preserves his elect. Jesus promises the following, and I quote, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my, out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In quote, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. The one who believes this gospel promise has comfort and assurance. He has peace with God. The one who does not believe this promise makes Jesus into a liar. Friends, Jesus is no liar. Salvation is certain for all of God's elect. The gospel comforts us. The law terrifies the sinner. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your written word. We confess our sins to you. Sins the law is revealed to us, and we ask that you have gospel mercy on us and wash our sins with the precious blood of Christ. We thank you for Christ who died for our sins, paying the debt we all owe, and we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to teach us the scriptures and how to rightly divide them. Help us to understand and practice the proper distinction between law and gospel so that we may magnify the gospel and glorify your holy name. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name, we pray. Amen.